Government contracting is complicated, but it really doesn't have to be. You don't know what you don't know, so be in the know. Join us for the Neo Dell Tech GovCon Coffee Show, where industry thought leaders discuss all things government contracting, with your hosts, Elizabeth Jimenez and Wolf Tears. Good morning. Good morning. How are you? I'm doing well. It's How so good you? to see you. It's good to see you too. I'm fabulous because today we are going to be talking about security. Yay. Isn't that exciting? <laughs> so I love it. So today, I think, it's, a, I think it's, a, it's one that like gives a lot of people trepidation, though. You That's know? true. You talk about security, and I think it automatically gets a, a bit of fear. And we don't want them to have that reaction. Though. You're right. You're right. And probably people would. So I'm really glad that you made that point, because we have a lawyer on today. Um, also makes people shake sometimes. Also makes people shaky, but we're here to set the record straight. Absolutely. And show that it's actually not something to be so fearful about. So we're going to hear some factual factoids. All right. And we're going to have Eric Crucius with Holland and Knight today. Hi. Welcome. Hi. Thank you. So Eric, uh, tell us a little bit about your background. You know, you know obviously you're a lawyer, but there's got to be more to you than that. I'm not scary, so no reason to be to have fear. That's Excellent. the first thing. Um, I'm at a law firm, Holland and I, a really large law firm, offices around the country. But I'm in the government contracts and cybersecurity groups. Okay. So I help, among other things, government contractors through their security issues, their cybersecurity issues, breach notifications, things like that. So um, I try not to strike fear in the hearts of people, and I usually am pretty successful at that. Um, but uh, yeah, just have a lot of experience in this area. I've been practicing for more than 20 years. Oh, wow. So you don't want to strike fear in them. You actually want to help them feel secure, right? Right. I mean, that's the idea is an ounce of prevention is worth a lot on the back end. Um, so we try to kind of help with that prevention aspect, with that security aspect, and get them to be feel secure and to actually be secure and be compliant. And that way, if something bad happens, they have the right walls in place to prevent uh, something bad from happening and if, or minimize whatever issues that they have. Yeah. Now, I think Eric's an interesting choice because I think when most people hear cybersecurity, mm -hmm. they think IT, techno person, you know, that's, that's it's, it's a software, the technical people that we need to be talking to. Yeah. But that's not who we're talking to today. I mean, so, so how does your role fit in with this whole very technical oriented uh, view I think most people have of cybersecurity? I mean, the regulations themselves and what contractors have to do is really a function of their contracts. Mm -hmm. And I come in as kind of a contract, contract expert and I can tell them what they need to do to kind of be compliant with those rules. Mm -hmm. And if you're compliant with those rules, you generally have good security. So it kind of fits all the way down the streamline where those contractors will then be compliant, but they also have good security mm -hmm. and um, they can sleep a little bit better at the end of the night. Right. So when you say compliance, I think that's a very broad term. Um, can you narrow it down for us a little bit? Or what, when we talk about compliance, it's, again, it seems a little bit amorphous. Yeah, and it is. And that's a function of what lawyers do to try to scare people. <laughs> but not you. Yeah, not me. No, no. Um, well, the compliance that a contractor has in this space is tied to their contracts. Mm -hmm. So it's as easy as looking at your contracts that you have and saying, all right, these are the rules that I have to live by with respect to cybersecurity. Mm -hmm. And this is what I have to follow. Whether, no matter what kind of rules the Department of Defense has put out or other agencies have put out, they'll all be right there in the contract for you. Now they may refer to other documents, so you may have to go reading elsewhere, but everything that you have to do is in your contract. And um, that makes things a lot easier. What makes things difficult for contractors is that each agency now has their own rules on cybersecurity and security in general. So we have different standards um, and the contractors have to be compliant with all those standards that are in all their different contracts. So there's good news and there's bad news. It's a function of the contract, that's great. So you're limited to that universe, but there's a lot of different universes that you have to kind of pick apart. And that does sound complicated because yeah. most contractors I know aren't necessarily working on one contract at a time. Right. They've got multiple contracts, and sometimes with multiple agencies. Yeah. I mean, how do you sort through that then? Yeah, one contract is a risky business strategy, I could tell you that. Um, <laughs> you don't want to lose that contract. Right. But um, you kind of generally have to kind of have a good IT security expert uh, in-house. You have to have good software running you know, your back office and your cybersecurity systems. And I would argue that you should also have a good lawyer to help you sift through all these different regulations. And generally, if you go, if you find the most stringent one and work off of that one, 
the other ones will fall into line, but you still have to check those other ones to see if they have these other meandering requirements that maybe don't fit under the umbrella of that stricter requirement. Right. Well, when we're talking about security, I mean, I've often heard, and I think you have too, Wolf, that like the smaller businesses don't really think it applies. You know, they're just really focused on one contract or two contracts, mm -hmm. and they figure, you know, they're not in trouble. I mean, do you get a lot of that? Absolutely. And I think a lot of contractors believe that are small, I'll never have a cybersecurity breach. Nobody knows who I am. Nobody's going to target me. And, you know, I've had somebody come up to me after a presentation who had two employees and said that they were the subject of a state-sponsored breach wow. from China or somewhere in, the, in Asia because the, the state acknowledged that this con contractor had a lot of useful information and they knew enough to target them, even though they just had a few employees. So uh, it doesn't matter how small you are. The regulations apply to you. And guess what? These foreign adversaries know who you are. Right, because a lot of information about what contracts were, were let to which companies is a lot of it's public information, right? That's correct. And contractors love to talk about their wins on their websites. Um, I won this great cybersecurity contract or I won this other contract and without saying where I'll have all this useful information in my systems on their websites, on these public websites also. So it's very easy for a state sponsored, uh, you know, cyber espionage person to kind of go on those websites and find out that information and then use that information to target those companies. Yeah. So it's important no matter what size business you're running. As right. a, as so being compliant with those regulations to keep, keep that information safe. Yeah. And you hear about so many breaches and it kind of surprises me because you would think that you know, what, regardless of size, everyone will be getting ready for, with some degree of good cyber hygiene. What do you think it's going to take? Or do you think that, you know, things are changing? I mean, we're almost 2022. We've had this remote work environment for so long. Do you see any changes coming that could really shift, you know, the mentality of the smaller businesses? I think there are a couple of changes. One, I think these, these increase in regulations and requirements um, that the Department of Defense specifically is putting out. I think that's going, that's how you're going to move companies if it's just a requirement to do business with the federal government. Um, I think we also just saw pretty recently the uh, Department of Justice announce an initiative where they're going to target companies who are not cybersecurity compliant with uh, the False Claims Act. They already have that power, but now they're announcing we're going to really be focusing on you. So there's nothing that does better than, than striking the fear in, in companies to get them to move, either contractual requirement and fear. And I think the government is using both kind of methods to try to push companies towards compliance. So I think we'll, we're starting to see a sea change. I mean, I think we've already started seeing it. Um, I know just from, a, from personally, I'm hearing from a lot of companies who are looking to make sure that they're cybersecurity compliant and making sure they have the right systems in place. And I think that's a function of the government pushing them in that direction, because in the end, a company is not going to be cost competitive if none of their competitors are cybersecurity compliant because it's not it's not the cheapest thing you could do although it's necessary to do business as soon as as soon as the government makes it necessary to do business with them then all those contractors will be in the same playing field and they'll all want to be cybersecurity compliant and i think we're at that point now yeah and so one of those big uh, compliance things that we keep hearing about in in the industry is uh the CMMC, those four famous letters. Can, can you tell us a little bit more about that and how that fits into you know, what you're talking about here? Yeah, sure. So years back, uh, about five years ago, the Department of Defense issued regulations that required certain contractors to have 110 security controls in place under NIST um, Special Publication 171, 800-171. And um, DOD realized it was a it was voluntary. It wasn't voluntary, but the, there was no third party certification. So you had to do it if you signed a contract, but DOD just assumed that you were being compliant with these 110 security controls. They didn't check and they just said, they just assumed by people signing these contracts, they knew that they had to be compliant. Well, it turns out that a lot of them weren't. And the Department of Defense realized that and- It's a bad assumption on their part. Right? Yeah, you know, I think they were, they were hoping mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, the hopes were dashed. So now not anymore. Hope is not in the post of security. Yeah, yeah, that's a good point. So, um, that's a good point. yeah, <laughs> hope for good security. You know, yeah. It may it just appear like that. Um, so they are looking for some kind of verification that these contractors are actually complying with these 110 security controls. And not just that, but maybe more than that, if you have really delicate information from the government, 
maybe a little bit less than that if you don't have very sensitive information from the government. So they developed CMMC, Cybersecurity Maturity Model Certification, and that does what that is is a third party you know, review of your cybersecurity controls. Do you have the right cybersecurity controls in place for the contract you want to get? So now, in order to have, once CMMC fully rolls out, in order to do business with the Department of Defense, you're going to have to have a third party come in and validate your cybersecurity controls. Mm -hmm. um, and it's going to take five years to roll out, so it's not going to be overnight. But even in the interim, the Department of Defense has rolled out two additional clauses that will require insertion in a database of how many of those 110 controls you're compliant with. Um, if you are, if you have um, controlled unclassified information. If you do, and you put that in a database, the government has the right to come in and verify that you, by doing an on-site audit, uh, that, that you're telling the truth, essentially, about those 110 controls. So now, there's going to be third-party validation of every contractor from the DOD, their cybersecurity controls, and that really kind of fixes the self-certification kind of mess, for lack of a better term, that we've seen. And that's where that False Claims Act kind of comes in, and that you're claiming to be compliant, and you're not, and so that's a false claim. Is that, is that where it kind of comes in there? Yes. Um, every time you submit an invoice to the federal government, um, that's a claim for money. And if, that, if those invoices are premised upon you being compliant with your contractual obligations, and then you're recklessly not, you're knowingly not, that essentially is a false, can be a False Claims Act violation. So um, what DOJ is announcing that they're going to look at those very carefully. And let's say, for instance, you've been certifying that you're compliant with 110 controls that were in your contract, um, and then it turns out that you just ignored it, right? And they found out that could be a False Claims Act violation. And the False Claims Act is treble damages. So if the government's paid you a million dollars during that time period, that's $3 million, plus about $20,000 for each invoice that you've submitted with the false claim. So it gets very expensive very quickly. Yeah. That sounds like that could easily sink a small business. It could, and it's kind of like, well, you know, what do you really want to focus on? Do you want to like run that risk? Mm -hmm. Or do you want to actually do something that's responsible and kind of taking care of your own ship at, at the end of the day? So, I mean, it's very clear, you know, when we talk about business and, yeah. and what's at stake, which decisions should be made. And yet it seems like, you know, some of the businesses still aren't completely convinced. Do you know why that is or what's your feeling on that? I think a lot of times we get these rollouts from the government and then they stop short of kind of fulfilling the promise of whatever that rollout is. Uh, we see it time and time again. It's almost like you know Lucy with the football and Charlie Brown. Mm -hmm. Poor Charlie Brown never <laughs> learns his lesson. But uh, for real here, I think you know the government's very serious about cybersecurity. We've lost trillions of dollars of intellectual property over the last decade uh, to cybersecurity breaches. The government is tired of losing, and they've lost it themselves too. So nobody's innocent in this. But um, they're tired of kind of losing all this intellectual property that makes the United States kind of a, a leader in the defense field. And if, if the Chinese have all our plans to build our warships and our airplanes, you know, what good are those plans anymore? <laughs> because they have the same technology that we do. So they don't, they don't want that happening anymore. So I think, I just don't see them letting up. And I think this, this signal from the Department of Justice recently, where they announced that they're going to be going headlong into cybersecurity, is not surprising. And it should be a signal to the whole contracting community out there that they need to be compliant. Because if they're not compliant, There'll be a whistleblower out there that can blow the whistle, or DOJ itself coming in and, and doing its own investigation. Well, tell me a little bit. I've heard, you know, with CMMC, this whole Spurs thing. I mean, to me, that sounds like, well, that's kind of one piece that the company has to take on themselves. Like, that's initiating, hey, I'm doing something about it. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Sure. I, I kind of look at the Spurs system as kind of a bridge the gap between now and when CMMC fully rolls, rolls out. Because it's for contractors who have controlled unclassified information. They have to go into that government database. They have to enter how many of those 110 controls they're compliant with. And then the government has the right to come in and audit that for medium and high risk contracts. It's not based on the contractor. So even if you feel like you're a low risk contractor, you still may get audited. It's based on how high risk the contract is seen, seen by the government. Is it a critical contract? Does it have important information in the creation or maintenance of the contract that the contractor is going to have? Then, then there may be an audit. So one thing that contractors should be very careful about is that, you know, you've essentially been contractors have essentially been self-certifying 
compliance with these 110 controls if they have that clause in their contract. And now it, they have to enter that in a DOD database. I've heard from a number of folks who have been saying they're compliant, now going to the DOD database and saying, well, we don't have compliance with 110 controls, maybe 100 of them. Mm. But we're, we have, you know, we're gonna work on getting compliant. We're gonna work on getting to those, those final steps. And you have to be careful because that initial, you know, taking on that contract with that clause in it, you've essentially been potentially certifying compliance with those 110 controls that you're complying with them. And now in Spurs, you're saying something different. So I think contractors should be very careful about these inconsistent certifications, essentially, by saying, by performing a contract with 110 controls and now entering something different in Spurs. So I would just say, call your local friendly government contracts lawyer and figure that one out. So walk us through really quickly, like a, you know, an example of, let's say company ABC said that they had all their 110 controls, um, you know, fulfilled and then they actually didn't but they have to put their spurs scoring or whatever that's called in what happens then like obviously they would call someone like you yourself to kind of walk them through it was this you know controlled and classified information or not what's kind of a case scenario of what happens in that situation so i mean one thing that hasn't happened yet is department of defense hasn't put those two data points together yet so they aren't as far as I know, looking at contractors who are entering something less than 110 in the Spurs database to see whether they've previously certified. There's nothing to stop them from doing that, but I haven't heard of them doing that so far. We may see the, that happening. Good to know, yeah. because people are thinking about that anyway. So Absolutely. it's gonna eventually come out and be discussed. So yeah. let's talk about it. I mean, I you heard to, it here first. Though. Yeah, <laughs> I would try to talk with them and say, well, maybe you didn't have controlled unclassified information. Maybe that clause in that initial contract was superfluous. So in, in make that determination that that clause, you know, you, there was no compliance requirement because it was kind of self-deleting. I'm not saying that that's the best legal argument that's ever been out there before, but it's highly dependent on the situation that each contractor has. You may be able to kind of make an argument like that. You may be able to kind of massage it on the controls. Maybe you were, thought you were compliant then, but then you really weren't, you did a further investigation. And then there may be a requirement for some kind of mandatory disclosure in that course, but every, factual situation is just so different that it's impossible to kind of give a like a blanket but those are kind of the things I would look at maybe change in posture possibly um, inapplicable inapplicability of the clause so there's a couple places I would start yeah and I, th I think the the key for me is that it, it's every government contract right. right and so we're not looking at just the large large contractors we're not looking at mediums we're looking at every everybody in, in this in this regard yeah. right no so one's left out. no one's left out and even when we look at things like the cmmc you know going down to the level one that's even applying to uh commercial items correct yeah yeah it, you think about a contractor that's mowing the lawn you know on a on a military base or on a dod facility they're going to be covered as a level one contractor and have to you know institutes you know the 20 or so basic controls that you have on a level one so there's no escape from this um right now it's just you still need to have that third party verification that you have those cybersecurity controls in place. It doesn't matter what you do, how you do it, how big you are, how small you are. If you don't have a certification, there's gonna come a point in time that DOD is just not gonna do business with you anymore. You made a really interesting point like a little bit earlier on about you know, you think it's important to have a legal expert on your team or kind of get the services from a legal expert, even for smaller contractors. And I can imagine, you know, oh, the cost or whatnot of, of having all of these resources available. Um, what would you kind of say to that type of argument? I would say the cost of compliance is much less than the cost on the back end if there's a breach or if something bad happens or losing contracts because you're not compliant, but I think most lawyers, including myself, work with small businesses, um, really small businesses, and we adjust our rates if we need to, you know, to, to make the relationship work for that small business. Um, it's not like we're gonna go out and do something for $5. <laughs> um, well, it's important I, that you say that yeah. because maybe there's a mentality that people have and they need to hear that it's not. Right, and it doesn't cost companies anything to call up a lawyer and find out what their rates are, how much something's gonna cost, at least it shouldn't. Uh, most lawyers are, are, that are reputable will not charge for inquiries like that. Um, I certainly wouldn't. Um, so you can, 
get a budget in place and 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 a lot of lawyers are willing to willing to work on a flat fee basis on certain things so you know how much it's going to cost i think the biggest fear and my parents were small and grandparents were small business owners and there's a fear that they had is what kind of bill am i going to get from my lawyer at the end of the month i have no idea is it going to be fifty thousand dollars or is it going to be five hundred dollars i mean you do have some clue but sometimes that's a very scary thing absolutely kind of dealing with that up front as a small business owner, you're in a much better position to kind of figure out, okay, I'm gonna budget X number of dollars for, to figure this out. That's the flat rate I agree to with my lawyer as long as we stay within the scope of what we're gonna do, no issues. And it makes it a lot simpler. It sounds like that's the right way to go about it just in general with the whole CMMC strategy is like mm -hmm. consult with a legal expert, um, trusted advisor, right? Kind mm -hmm. of work out a plan that makes sense mm -hmm. based on your business, based on your contracts specifically, and then put that plan in place so that you have those milestones there. I mean, that sounds pretty logical. Yeah, certainly. And 110 or more reason, uh, things you have to be compliant with are not necessarily things that you would do all at once, right? right? You're gonna have a plan to get compliant and have those have those controls in place, have those 110 controls in place so that you can be compliant at the end of the day. It's not going to be a, a we both work in the software industry. We know that these things don't happen at the drop of a hat. Right. Yeah, and I think that's a good signal too to the authorities, you know, yeah. if a legal expert is involved and kind of taking hand holding along the way, so with other vendors. Absolutely, absolutely. And I think, um, you know, all those vendors can work together in kind of your own little concert. Yeah, <laughs> work in concert with each other. And I think that's a very, you know, it's not just a strategy where a lawyer is involved or an IT professional is involved. It's kind of a more of a fulsome strategy where you get all these experts to come in and figure it out. And they do it often enough, it's not gonna be a high cost, you know, relatively speaking, a high cost endeavor because they do it all the time and know, know how to make it work. Right, and that's, that's very true. I mean, when you look at Dell Tech and Neo Systems, I mean, we have our own cloud offering and our, our GovCon moderator, our GovCon standard cloud comes with certain controls and certainly we provide that. I know Neo Systems has their own offerings that are, help, help businesses with these controls and maintaining some of that security. But on both our sides, we, are, we both know it's never 100% on us as, as a software vendor. There's a lot that's still being put on that small business, medium-sized business, a large business that is working with us even. Right, yeah, it's, it's, there's a lot of different bridges you have to gap in order to kind of get that fulsome solution. Um, and the software vendors play an equally important role to the lawyers, to the IT professionals who kind of get into the system and figure out which controls are still lacking. And there's that connection between what you all do in the business itself, because the business is going to be responsible on their own for some of the controls. Um, and it's not going to fall on the managed security folks or the cloud folks. Um, so it's, it, yeah, it's, it's not it's an easy. It's collaborative effort. Yeah, it's collaborative. That's exactly, that's exactly right. And uh, I think the professionals who have business hires should be able to work together and kind of figure that out together. Absolutely. Well, I was going to say, I, I know that, um, cybersecurity is usually a very scary thing for people and it sounds like they should be scared. I mean, both in a, in a chance for a potential breach or on the other side, they may not get a breach, but they may get non-compliance or false claims. And there's, there's a lot of scary things around that. But I'm glad we've kind of had this conversation. It kind of clears things up for me. How about you, Elizabeth? Right, no, 100%, Wolf, because I think taking that, you know, just explaining it, just articulating, this is something that's doable, it's achievable. Here's mm -hmm. how you can set it up. These are the type of stakeholders you need involved in the process, and here's a time frame. It's like a project. Right, Absolutely. can't run through cost point, like you can't run the whole thing through yeah. cost point <laughs> no, you can't. as a project, <laughs> but it does make you it sound like it's, it a you that could sounds, see the wheels are turning. But <laughs> software update coming soon. Is it software <laughs> update coming? No, but you're absolutely right. And so I've, I've, this has been really helpful. Is there anything that you want to leave the audience with? Any parting thoughts? Just that it shouldn't, like you said, it shouldn't be scary. This is something that every contractor can do. It's going to be something every contractor is expected to do. So it's great to get out in front of it now. This could be seen as a competitive advantage even if it's not required. I love that, competitive mm -hmm. advantage. Absolutely, everybody's looking for one. I know, totally true. Well, thank you so much for your time. Sure. I really appreciate it. It's thanks been very informative. Very, very informative. Have a great day and thanks for coming. Sure, thanks for having me.